Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Senior Living Today. Um, we have a very special episode in honor of Veterans Day today, and I am honored to be joined by three of our community veterans at Springfield Masonic Community, Bruce, Ken, and Donna. Thank you all so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Sure. You bet. Um, thank you for your service, first of all. And we want to talk a little bit about um, your time during the service. So, um, Ken, I'll go ahead and start with you. Right. Um, what branch of the military and what years did you serve? Um, I was in the U.S. Signal Corps, the U.S. Army, from 1959 to 62. And I served uh, in Germany for a year, in North Carolina, and where the uh, 82nd Airborne Division is based. I didn't get to jump, but I was with the 50th Signal Battalion, and oh, we wow. were core support for the 82nd Airborne Division. Wow. Well, thank you for your service. You're welcome. Thank you. Bruce, what branch did you serve in, and what years did you serve during? Army, uh, 66 through 68, active, yeah. Thank you for your service. And Donna, what about you? Army National Guard. Now, I'm not a weekend warrior. <laughs> I was, I was full-time quite a bit. And I went in 1982 and got out in 2020. Wow. Well, thank you for your service. You're welcome. Um, so I'm going to kind of open this up to you guys, but I, I would love to hear about a story that was special to you um, during your years in the military. Uh, who would like to go first? Bruce? Yeah, I was drafted, and I was married at the time. <clears throat> Went through basic at Fort Jackson, uh, Fort Rucker for aviation maintenance training, and then straight to Vietnam. And I worked uh, there for five months in the main base, 1st Cav Division, which is a aircraft unit, aviation unit, building a church and building bunkers to protect the helicopters on the main runway. <clears throat> First Cav has 10,000 people in it, and this was their base camp. And I had an MOS to work on helicopters, so I also had a construction background, so I did that, and it was very enjoyable. And the church especially was very, very uh, rewarding because it was the new church for this whole uh, area for the, the battalion, actually two battalions, 229th and the 227th. Uh, attack helicopter units at the home base. And then I got assigned to a aircraft after roughly five months and then went out into the field. And it was a gunship company, a UH-1C model with guns that are controlled by the uh, co-pilot. The guns can go left, right, up, down, and they got stops on them so they don't hit the rotor blades. <clears throat> and the pilot, because he controls the attitude of the aircraft, controls the rockets to fire the rockets. And our purpose in, in, in the war was to guard the ships that were taking in the troops, 10 per aircraft, uh, to do battle. And uh, I did that for uh, roughly seven months and uh, very enjoyable R&R. &R. After six months, met my wife in Hawaii. <clears throat> very, very enjoyable. Of course, a lot of our daily duties were not. And I have to be careful how I talk about some of those because it gets quite emotional. But at any rate, on the September the uh, 27th, 1967, uh, 13 days before I was to leave, we got shot down, and just before dawn, our, and this is uh, not a good memory, but <clears throat> our duty was to guard the rivers after the hours of darkness. Uh, no watercraft were allowed to be on the rivers. So one aircraft would be flying, which was ours, at treetop. Another aircraft would be flying at 1,800 feet roughly with lights on to draw fire because the General says, can't fire unless fired upon. So our company commander, uh, division commander, came up with this idea. And unfortunately, we got hit just before dawn. And no one was hurt. And uh, 
our aircraft was hauled back to the main base with a Chinook, which is a big double rotored aircraft. And I got sent home 15 days later. I was with my lovely wife. And end of that story. Thank you for sharing that, Bruce. Ken? I served in the, in, uh, the Army during the um, Cold War, which was the Russians and the United States were always badgering back and forth. I was in the comm center as I was a general cryptographic repair. And in the crypto room, we had um, communications with the troop train. The troop train left Frankfurt and about halfway to Berlin, it got stopped in East Germany. And of course, the communications back and forth between the commander of the troop train and the commander of Third Army. And uh, the conversation goes like, we can't go forward, we can't go back, advise. Well, this is Thanksgiving time. And the commander says, uh, stand by, we'll see what we can do. At that point, we were all confined to the base. The next communication was, we think we have things settled, but the troop train didn't move. So we were issued rifles and ammunition. We were getting ready to load into the trucks. Now, I'd, I was not loading in the trucks. I said I was in the comm center. The commander of the troop train calls back and he says, you know, my troops are getting hungry. Are we going to get Thanksgiving dinner? And the commander, Third Army, says, you will have Thanksgiving dinner in Frankfurt or Berlin, or we will bring it to you. And at that point, we were ready to load into the vehicles and we're going to go get the troop train. And about 10 minutes later, the troop train commander calls back and he says, guess what? We're moving towards Frankfurt. So that was about the exciting thing that I ever came to being in, actually involved in Conrad. Well, thank you for sharing that story, Ken. So the next topic I know might be a little bit more sensitive. So if everybody doesn't feel comfortable sharing, that's fine. But um, how did the military and service impact your families? Uh, I'll address that. You can go ahead, Bruce. Yeah, I was married at the time only a few months. And uh, <clears throat> it impacted her a lot. In any case, uh, you couldn't communicate back then. Uh, two-way radio people. It was called Mars, military, I don't remember. Yeah. And we got two phone calls during the, the year I was in Vietnam. And I don't remember the dates of them. And you had to say over and out with the in, in between people. I don't know about shortwave radios. But it wasn't any phone conversations, a letter every day I would get and sometimes more, and I tried to do the same with her, and she, to this day, they know my wife, <laughs> teases me about that. You know, I didn't, I didn't write every day, but I did the best I could. And uh, uh, we got through it, and when it was over, I got home, and here I am. Safe and silent. And absolutely. Praise That's the Lord. That's what matters. Yeah. Yeah. As far as I was concerned, I was married and I enlisted in the Army. I had a three-year tour to do. And I was already married. And when I found out I was going to Germany, my wife says, I'll meet you there. And I thought, wait a minute, I'm only an E4. I don't think you can go. And she says, I can go as a civilian. So she booked passage on an airplane and flew over to Frankfurt I took a troop ship and I was in the ocean for a long time. When I got there, they said, you're going to go to Frankfurt because I stopped in Bremerhaven. That's the big uh, port for Germany. I got to Bremerhaven. They shipped us down to Frankfurt. And the guy says, where's this McGill guy? And I said, right here, Sergeant. <laughs> he says, uh, you're not going to the barracks. I thought, oh, oh now what? He says, your wife's waiting for you on 18 uh, um, Eschenheimer Landstrasse, which means 18 Eschenheimer Street. And I said, oh, okay, how do I get there? And he says, we'll take you there. So she had gotten over to Germany before I did because she flew. Mm -hmm. 
she found an apartment and was waiting and called the post because she knew when I was coming and says, send him over to me. <laughs> and so <laughs> I had uh, my wife with me the whole tour in wow. Germany. That's so special. It, it was special. Yeah, yeah, yes, it was very special. We did a lot of touring in, in Europe, but because of my security clearance, I couldn't go to into the East Germany, I had to stay at least 100 miles from the border. That's not too hard to do in Germany because you, you know, 50 miles and you're in another area. I give an example. My wife and I were square dancing. So we went to uh, go to Luxembourg for a square dance convention. We left Frankfurt, we had Belgium, we had Luxembourg, and then we were in the uh, army base in Luxembourg or the Air Force base in Luxembourg. We went through Belgium, and they started saying something, and we had two German nationals with us. Uh, one was a man, one was a girl, a woman, and uh, they started speaking Belgium, and the lady in the back says, I can answer that for you, and she answered in French. Then we got into Luxembourg, and they started spouting something off, and the guy says, I speak German, tell me German, and I'll interpret it. So they... Luxembourg people spoke German. The German in, interpreted, gave it to me, and I had to go back and forth. So it's so strange because we in the United States, we can go 100 miles, 200, 1,000 miles, and we never get outside of the United States unless we go to Canada or if you're down in Texas and you go to Mexico. So you never hear a foreign language. But here, here we were, the four of us, we could speak French, Belgium, German, English, and Spanish. And they were all had in that same car. So that was an interesting trip. That's cool. Yeah. Can I go back? Yeah, of course. R&R <laughs> &R from the war zone in mid midway. I get to choose where I want to go. Mm -hmm. and, and everybody was going to Bangkok and all these single guys. And I get a letter from the wife and says, when's your R&R? &R? And I says, such and such. She says, well, we're going to Hawaii. I'll meet you there. <laughs> so that, that's, yeah. that reminded well, me of that. That was so exciting. And yeah. It's the most memorable thing of this whole military experience. I'm sorry. Go that's ahead. okay. You're fine. Okay. Um, for me, I was taking troops up north, and uh, we did not get to call home very often. And I was the NCO in charge, so we were fueling. So I said, co-drivers, go f five minutes, call your home, come back. You take over and refuel, and the other one goes. Well, it got to my turn, and I called home, and uh, I was talking to my mom and dad, and all of a sudden, we're under fire. And you can hear the scuds coming up across us. And my mom says, Ross, what is that? And he goes, Mary, your daughter is in a war zone. What? I can't believe that. Not Donna. She wouldn't hurt anybody. And, and Dad said, <laughs> Mary... She's in the National Guard, and her unit got called up because their transportation, and they have to get all the equipment from the back of the line up to the front of the line. And and she goes, but what is that? Boom. <laughs> I said, sorry, guys, i got to run. i got to go. go take care of my troops. <laughs> so it definitely... Kind of threw her for a loop to hear it. Oh, I can only imagine. Oh, and, uh, <laughs> wow. The Mars, which is military radio, military amateur radio affiliate. I was a Mars member for about seven, eight, ten years. And we would patch people through what we call patch. They would call from, say, Saigon. We would get a radio transmission and they'd say, call so-and-so in Springfield. So I would dial the phone to Springfield, and when they got on the phone, I would switch from the phone to the radio, and then the signal would go out, and he mentioned you have to say over. Well, if I'm talking to my wife, 
and I stop talking, she doesn't know if I've got more to say or whatever. So we have to say over, and then she can talk because it's a one-way mm -hmm. trans one-way transmission, and that, that's from the amateur radio. That's why I brought it up. Thanks. <laughs> We often did a lot of patches. During the time that I was in the service, I had an amateur radio license, and at home we would talk to people in Korea. I lived in Cleveland, or the suburb of Cleveland, and I would get a call. We have a serviceman stationed in Korea. would like to talk to his father, mother, somebody in the Cleveland area. Can you handle it? I would say yes, and I'd call and dial the number, and i say, I have your son on the, on the radio. When you speak and you finish speaking, say over. And they say, do I have to? I say, yes. <laughs> Otherwise, you don't know when the transmissions are. So we patched a lot that way. We had a, another guy that had a tremendous setup. He could, he could take four or five calls at once and spread them out throughout the amateur radio community in wow. the Cleveland area. Wow. Amateur radio, the hams, as we referred to, in the Mars and the Air Force facilities, they always did quite a lot, especially at Christmas time. And that was the most enjoyable because when you hear that this guy's in Seoul, Korea, or he's somewhere in the middle of nowhere, and he's calling to talk to his mm -hmm. wife, mother, children or something, it's always a pleasant uh, experience to tie them in and let them and of course, you have to hear over the mm -hmm. conversation, and so you feel kind of bad eavesdropping. But, but you get to connect them. But you have to yeah. because you don't know when they're going to switch back and forth. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all for sharing that. Um, so earlier this August, as a thank you to serving our country, you guys got to take a ride um, through Dream Flights. Um, did you enjoy your flight? What memories do you have from that day? How were you feeling? I remember that very vividly because it's been almost 30 years since I've been in the air. And so wow. to get into that particular aircraft, aircraft and have it be open, I've never been in an open cockpit before. And I was expecting all kinds of wind and, they, and there wasn't any because the canopy mm -hmm. protects you. You don't see it. And to fly with um, Daryl, he, he's an excellent fellow. I, I enjoyed talking to him after we got back on the ground. And I think I related a story about the ball in an aircraft. So I won't go into that now unless you want me to. Go ahead. <laughs> there's Absolutely. A, there's an instrument in the aircraft called the needle ball. And it's a round instrument with a ball. And the ball swings back and forth from left to right. And there's also a needle. So they get the name needle ball. Mm -hmm. When the pilot makes a turn to, say, the left, that ball is supposed to be centered. If it goes off to one side, you're in a slip. If it goes to the other side, you're in a, a skid. And that you feel that in the airplane. So airplanes want to make a coordinated turn. Well, when I was flying with Daryl, I was watching that ball, and it never moved out of that socket. It was just like it was stuck there. And when I got on the ground, I said, Daryl, I think you got a problem with one of your instruments. And he said, oh, yeah, which one? I said, the needle ball. And he says, oh, I said, the ball never moves. It's stuck there. And he said, no, it's not. He says, I'm a good pilot. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. I, I can speak to that from the uh, helicopter side. The crew chief in a, a UH-1 D model, C model, A model, A, B, C, D, and we had a C, the crew chief sits on the left side so he can see between the seats and he's in charge of the daily maintenance of the aircraft and he can see the instruments and assist the pilot if there's something astrew, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, that's part of his job. And uh, I was a gunner on the right side and my responsibility was to take care of the rockets and the, and the guns and maintenance every day, clean them and reload them and all that kind of stuff, so... I can relate to that from the crew chief side. He actually got stick time yeah. occasionally. <clears throat> yeah. I tried to fly a helicopter one time. Couldn't do it. I'd had like <laughs> 200 hours in the private aircraft. And I thought, yeah, I can do that. He said, the uh, pilot said, okay, imagine you have a saucer 
and you put a pencil in the center of the saucer. Now let go of the saucer. I said, no, it'll fall. He said, that's exactly what happens. You got to make sure that you do a little circle so that that keeps that airplane stationary. I couldn't do it. He had to take over. Yeah, you had fixed wing experience. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't fly in a helicopter for a very, very long time uh, because of my issues with being shot down. And one of my friends was killed in another incident, which I witnessed. And uh, anyway, uh, 1999, we went to Las Vegas for a trip and I got talked into flying in a helicopter. <clears throat> and we went down into the Grand Canyon and had wine and cheese. And I flown um. it. I've flown in a helicopter at least eight or ten times since then, one of which is, by coincidence, a aircraft that was in my unit the year before I was in that unit, and it's completely restored in Peru, Indiana, and they have two different names because they're nonprofit organizations, and uh, I got to fly in that helicopter ultimately uh, with my grandson, so that was kind of cool. Wow. What a special moment. Um, so Bruce and Donna, going back to the day you took the dream flights, uh, how did you guys feel that day? Oh, I thought it was smooth and nice, and it was wonderful compared to a helicopter. And yes, Daryl is, is obviously a good good pilot, and he told me he, the organization owns several of those aircrafts, and I was amazed that they were World War II aircraft one of them is Boeing. I don't remember. Boeing. <clears throat> I don't remember. I don't remember the name. Stearman. And they're worth a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And they own several of them. And I think that's a wonderful, wonderful thing that they're doing for the veterans. And I felt fortunate enough because uh, they started with World War I, World War mm -hmm. II, Korea, Vietnam, and then the later wars. And I felt honored that I was able to go on that for free, and it's cool. <laughs> I got to see the Navistar uh, assembly plant and all the stuff that is around mm -hmm. there, the lakes and what have you, and I enjoyed it. It was smooth and a lot much more comfortable than what I was experiencing before. Um, let's see. I enjoyed it quite a bit. Uh, I used to be an aircraft dispatcher, so I used to have to sit behind the pilot and observe what he's doing, um, and I hadn't done that in a long time. And uh, so when I got up there, I just was like in awe and thinking, you know what, I'm going skydiving because this is cool. <laughs> <laughs> and it, you wouldn't do that oh my goodness I challenge you I would do it <laughs> I'm in I'll go with you're you you're on I'm in <laughs> you're on alright cool <laughs> I spent uh, a year at uh, Fort Bragg North Carolina which is the home of the 82nd Airborne Division we were assigned to the division and everybody in our uh, unit in the comm unit were jump qualified except me. I didn't go. So they'd say, okay, you're going to go this month? I say, yeah, maybe next month. Maybe next month. I put it off and put it off. <laughs> Finally, one time the 82nd got called up to go to Grenada and they mm -hmm. were supposed to land, jump into Grenada, circle the university and protect American students there. And they said, now see, if you'd been jump qualified, you could go with us. I said, you see, I'm still legs, what they call a leg, because you're not a jumper, I'm a leg. I said, I'm a leg, and that's why I stayed here. <laughs> <laughs> I got a ribbon all the time because I wouldn't go airborne. And finally, uh, they said, okay, Ken, you're going to go to Germany. And I said, okay, I'll go. So then I left the 82nd Airborne area and went to Germany. So as we wrap up today, um if you could all please just share your thoughts on the significance of Veterans Day and what it means to you. I've thought about that uh, quite a bit. And uh, Veterans Day is, for me, a time to remember the soldiers, sailors, airmen, the servicemen who gave their lives for the, in the service of their country. I have two uncles that were in World War II. 
One was a tank commander, and another one was just a regular foot soldier. He got captured by the Japanese somewhere, and I'm not real sure. Our genealogy says he was in the slave labor camp. And another aspect of the genealogy is that he was in a coal mine when he was killed. He was killed because he wouldn't work fast enough. Anyway, because Uncle Bob was in the service and gave up his life, I thanked the people who educated me in the service that I could give my life if I needed to. Uncle Bob was in the, uh, this is the other uncle, he was in the tank commander. He was a, a, like a battalion commander. He led the tanks that came into Dachau when they liberated the uh, prisoner of war camp. They helped, Bob had a lot of uh, pictures that he had taken while he was in the tank and going through Dachau. They would never let me see him because they said, oh, you're too young, you're too young. When I was in Germany, I had a chance to go to Dachau. So I thought, now when I come back, I can say, I bid the Dachau, now show me these. Well, when I got back, Uncle Bob was very sick and he died. So I didn't get to see the photographs that he had. I imagine they were pretty gruesome because he, his battalion was one of the first ones that went through the gates of Dachau. So realizing what could have happened with the people that were in the concentration camps, that could very well happen in this country if we ever lost the war. So I was glad that I could serve my country as a serviceman. And I thank all the other service people who are now active duty in their service for their country. Thank you. I feel the same way. I had numerous uncles that were in the military, some of which had PTSD that was really out of this world, and they didn't call it that back then. And one was a guy that was rode in a tank, and he had they called it shell shock back then. And uh, I felt extremely uh, proud to serve, and I made it through it. I have a friend that did it. And I know of numerous others in my unit that didn't make it. And I have rubbings from the wall. And I'm very, very adamantly in, in favor of Veterans Day, doing anything that we can do to honor the veterans, uh, those that served both in war and not in war. Uh, they all have a purpose. And when they made it a pay uh, job, I supported that. Uh, of course, I still would support a draft if it were, if it were needed because I was drafted. And uh, like he said, uh, there's they, all they lost their lives and, and they need to be honored because they're gone and their families and their heirs appreciate it. Um, for me, uh, Veterans Day is a day that I make sure that I pray for the families that have lost their loved ones, and I pray for the families that uh, their children have gone off to war. Um, I think Veterans Day is very honorable, and every time... I walk past a veteran in the VA, I tell them, thank you for serving. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. And it just gives me chills and goosebumps. And I don't really think of me, you know, uh, celebrating Veterans Day, but I do think of everybody else because I think it's really important, you know, that what that we recognize, but we also need to recognize the families too. So Veterans mm -hmm. Day should be a special day for the families. You know, they're, they're soldiers in their own way. Absolutely. Well, I wanna thank all of you again for sitting down with me today. It was an absolute honor to listen to all of your stories and thank you for sharing those um, with everybody who's listening today. Um, and also thank you again for your service. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate My it. My pleasure.